Hello and welcome back to the Behind the Laughs Comedy Podcast, where I'm joined by my dad, Mike. My name is Andrew, and today we are going to be interviewing Keith Godwin. So let's go. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing well, man. I'm looking forward to your call. It was uh, I listened uh, to your first show with Scott, and uh, I really enjoyed it. And I'm excited to be uh, your second guest. You know what I was thinking too, Keith? Like you and I have worked together for like 17 years, but I don't really know much about your comedy, how you started or anything. Isn't it amazing how we could perform with these guys all these years, but we don't really know that much about them? So, if for the people who don't know, Keith is probably my oldest comedy friend. We were in the same comedy class together, and so I know Keith about 17 let's years. Let's not say oldest, let's say longest. Longest, let's... that's a better word. <laughs> that's a better word. Seventeen. It's about 17 years, right? Because I was 40 when I took that class. Yeah, yeah. If it was 17 years ago, you were 40. Yeah, I was probably, uh, I'm 52 now, so... Uh... You know, I don't even know how old I am. I'm not really good at math. That's why I do comedy. <laughs> right. If you could start us off, tell us, like, this whole, how did you ever think about ever getting on stage? I never even asked you that. All the years I know you. All right, great. First, I want to say hello to your son, because you know I'm a big fan of your son, Andrew, <laughs> and your and your whole journey there. And, uh, you know, and I remember you told me something about Andrew once. You're like, you know, because, uh, you know, as a comic, I'm very insecure sometimes. And you're like, my son really loves your act. And I'm like, he really does? <laughs> <laughs> I was so excited that he really liked me. And he wasn't just going because he had to be with his dad, you know? Well, he was only eight at the time, so what the heck did he know? <laughs> he just thought you were being this big, cool, tall guy. He didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> So how you doing, Andrew? I just wanted to say hello real quick. Hey, what's going on? I love your ex. Not, not much. <laughs> not much. So, yeah, I just wanted to share that because I, I never, see, I, you know, I always felt that, but I never, I didn't care if he's eight. He could have been three. <laughs> as long as he liked my show, I'm going to take it, Mike. Oh, I learned not to be particular with people who like me, whether they, if they could be deaf. If they found me amusing, I, I'm good with that, you know. It's, I couldn't agree. Uh, I'm going to take credit. I'm going to be like, well, they were deaf. They couldn't hear you. <laughs> yeah, but they were looking at my facial expression, and that's why they thought. I was funny, you know. I'm spinning. You take what yeah. you can get because nobody will ever tell you you're funny in this business ever, <laughs> right? Yeah. No, it's not totally true. I mean, what's one thing I like about you and uh, also me? Like, because we've both done amazing shows and we've both had some not so amazing shows, and uh, we'll be honest with each other. It's like, oh, you were good, but I've seen you better. I, you did this bet better last time and me and you can handle it from each other like oh okay yeah i agree but a lot of comics that they'll ask you and then they'll be like upset when you don't give them like they were great you know i was like why are you asking me if you really don't want the truth so um you know when i do do well i have a lot of guys who will tell me i do well and uh you know or or or, or audience members but i know when i don't have it and people are just being nice and that's even worse if i don't have it and i'm not good don't tell me i did good cuz that hurts me more than just telling me i was bad you know yeah. yeah you walk up stage and they're like they tell the other comic you were great and they look at you and they're like oh you were good too <laughs> that, that's how you know you probably didn't do that well Right. Or you had great stage presence. That's the other I one, right? I hated that. I hated yeah. that. Uh, yeah. yeah. But am I funny? Like, but the other comics will generally not. Why won't comics tell each other you're really funny? Like, why doesn't anyone ever say that? They're afraid if someone else is as funny as them? I don't agree with you on that. Um, I tell a lot of comics I think they're hilarious, and I see you do it too. And there are uh, a lot of comics who tell me I am a certain comics. I think with the newer comics and the insecure comics, they have their own insecurities, so they they think almost like if I tell him he's funny, that makes me less funny, or he's yeah. better than me, and you know, it's like a thing that goes on in some people's heads. Some people don't care, and they're just like, I wish everyone was funny. Other people uh, view it as like, uh, and a lot of comics get into it, because we're not all well. We all have our things, and part of us, like, and, and the question you asked me, use comedy to help us with those things in our life that we need to address. So I really think a lot of comics have a lot of insecurities, and almost acknowledging someone else did good is like, um, you know, it, it makes you feel less than like you're not as good which is ridiculous you know it's weird it's people with a lot of insecurities you think the last thing they want to do is get on stage and <laughs> and humiliate themselves but i agree with you we ran a company for three years together you're still running the company but well we brought, well, it was longer than three years it? i mean we 
Okay. Yeah, for a lot longer than three years. I mean, we did it. Uh, we started out. Um, you know, I remember how we started out. We just were new comics, and no one wanted to put us on stage. So we're like, let's start our own company, <laughs> <laughs> so we can put ourselves on stage. Yeah, that's why. That's that's really the main reason I think we started it. Plus, we were having a great time. But right, and we developed friendships and relationships, and um, you know, uh, with comedy and. You know, uh, and we, you know, kind of uh, use some of our other skills. And, and uh, you know, I always uh, thank comedy. And you asked me, the question you asked me is why I got into comedy. And, um, you know, and part of what you do know about me is, uh, you know, I work in the recovery field. I am in recovery. But I got into comedy, and I was a big drinker and partier for many years. But I never did comedy, you know, when I drank or partied. I did it when I was in, when I was uh, sober. I was sober for, um, you know, like not drinking or using drugs for a few years. And um, I always like to make people laugh. I remember I was in a rehab, um, you know, and um, we used to have like a morning meeting. And I like did a joke of the day and like a Confucius say, like Confucius say, man who eats yellow snow, whatever. It's just stupid shit. And everyone like looked forward to it. Like, you know, and, and people didn't want to get out of bed and they were missing the morning meeting and they were getting in trouble. But a lot of people came just to hear my stupid joke of the day and, and whatever. And then we started to do skits like about, you know, our addiction and stuff. And I started to get involved with doing skits to make people laugh in the morning. And um, it, it just uh, from there, I was just like, that was fun. And then I didn't really think of comedy for a little while. And I met a girl and, um, you know, we were going to um, which is um, it was a convention for people in recovery and they had like anyone who wants to get on stage can get on stage and they hired like five professional comics to do like 15 minutes each it was one of those nightmares where they had like 20 people doing talent and i was one of the you know and i was like yeah i'm going to get on stage and you know so the the, the guys who were paid the professional comics and you got to remember this is an event where there's no alcohol everyone's in recovery they all bombed, and these are all guys who do comedy, and they just sit there because they just tried to do jokes and be and connect. I just talked about me and my life and drug addiction and having a rug burn on the side of my face from looking under doors when, you know, I had a transvestite hooker in the corner, you know, like crazy shit. and they were, they, they were hysterical. They were laughing, and I was like, wow, this was great. I had so much fun, and I never did comedy, and I was like, I was better than the to me not that i was better than them but that day i was you know i just had i went up there without any fear without any expectations and i just killed it and um that was my first comedy experience and then i was with a girl and she's like well there's a comedy school and she found the advertisement for comedy school and i was like i'm going to go to comedy school and um that's when i met you and i was in that class with carrie Carabas. so that's how you know, our journey started. Okay, so Keith, that's a great story that I never asked you about. So can we back right. up, back up a little bit to this NA? It's an NA show where you performed. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, it was a Narcotics Anonymous can like uh, you know uh, convention where they were just raising money and they were doing like a talent show because okay, so how many people a lot were there? of pe how many people were there? Probably about 150. Okay, so is it safe to say that you wouldn't have had the courage to go on stage except you were running these meetings with these guys at your work and you were developing a little confidence, doing a little comedy? Is that fair to say? Not not in my case. I just, and, and you knew me early in my comedy career. I didn't care. I didn't care about anything or anyone. I would get up anywhere and do anything at any time. Well, what made you I get up had... on stage and just think you could do stand-up comedy when you've never done it before? Because I just thought my stories were hilarious. I thought, you know, like the world revolves around me, and I had these things in my head, and, you know, I just, um, you know, uh, I was a little nervous, but I really, um, I don't know, I just had this feeling, and I've taken a lot of risks in my life, unhealthy risks, and at that time, I'm just like, what's the worst that can happen? And I just went up there, and I just, I got out of my own head, and I just, once I got that first laugh, I just started to have fun i loosened up and they had to kind of like almost pull me off the stage how, 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 you know how, like, how much like, time did you do i think i did about like nine minutes and for the first time you get up they only wanted us to do five but i just kept going because i was doing good and they were trying to pull me off at like six but i stayed on another now, three did you, minutes did you so, prepare something ahead of time i did a little bit i did this thing about starbucks coffee and, and you know, so i had like one or two things that i prepared but i mostly most of what I did um, was off the cuff, 
you know, um, I, I, you know, it was just adding on because I didn't even know what preparing was. I just thought of something in my head that I thought okay. was mildly so did amusing. You, did, did you sign up ahead of time for this thing? Or yeah. when you were there, yeah. they just asked whoever wanted to get it. Okay, so, so you knew this was going to happen, and you had one or two ideas jotted down, you had something to say, and that was your first experience doing stand-up comedy. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Were you hooked after then? Is that was it? You were hooked? No. I, I you know, I did it, and uh, I was just like, I felt really good. I felt proud, and I, and I and I kind of let it go. And maybe like a few months later, or six months later, um, is when the, the, a girl I was dating gave me this thing for comedy school. She heard it on the radio, or whatever, and she goes, "Why don't you go to comedy school? You liked comedy. You did this thing." And um, you know, then uh, when I did comedy and I did the comedy class. And part of it is I'm a people person, and I like the people I met. If you remember our class, we had, like, Bob Baker, who does ventriloquism. We had Terry McNeely, yep. myself, you, Mark Zachrin. I mean, Keith Anthony came down to teach. Yep. Carrie Caravis was teaching. We just had a really fun freaking class, and, you know, you were there. And, and you know, I just um, I liked, you know, everyone I was there with. And you know what? I, I liked the network, and I just it, it became part of my life. I was spending like three or four days a week with you guys doing comedy, going to bars and clubs, getting on stage, writing right, new before, stuff. It was it, just really exciting. Yeah, you know, it, it was a great crew, but before that happened, we had to go through this comedy class with Carrie. And so right. what did you think of the class? I loved it. Uh, I just, um, and I, the first time I got on stage, um, w when you graduate the class, we do a show, and I did pretty well. Uh, you know, but... I thought I did pretty well, but I had a lot of people because it was my first time doing comedy, and you always think you do great when you have a, I had about 50 people in the audience for my first show. So I did, um, you know, they were all there, and, um, you know, I, I did the show, and I, I had some fun, and uh, I thought I had a pretty good set. And uh, I think after that, my family seeing me and everyone talking about, you know, uh, you know, you did great, I think that's when I really got the bug and I got hooked. And um, then it was like, what do I do now? How do I stay involved? And I found, uh, you know, and I just started going to all these open mics and, uh, you know, open mic, you know, well, you know, I know you and uh, Andrew know, but it's just where comics get together to practice their stuff. And me and you actually ran an open mic that was probably one of the best because it wasn't only just an open mic where comics go and it's like painful. They listen to each other and they're just waiting for the next. It was actually fun. People came and people were laughing at each other, and we had a pretty good crowd there, and we had some uh, really top comics coming down, you know, to practice their stuff and to help us out, and um, it it got me on stage a lot, um, you know, because I used to host it a lot, of me, the me or you hosted it, and um, I just really, that's when I started. It gave me something to do with my life, um, because a lot of my life revolved around, you know, partying and drinking, and... Um, this just kind of filled a different void for me. And, um, you know, some of the relationships I have were just precious, and they still are. So, so Keith, yeah, I want to talk about Chesterfields a little bit because that was like a unique uh, um, open mic. I've never experienced any other one like that. But when uh, it seems like when we perform, to me, you don't ever seem nervous. Uh, what is your level of nervousness when you get up on stage? I asked Scott Papp that, and I was surprised about how nervous he said he gets. You know what? It's funny because um, in the beginning, and you used to say this to me, I had no fear of nothing. And as I started doing it longer, and uh, you know, and uh, you know, I and after having a few rough sets, I started to get nervous. Then, wow, like I lost that, I lost that, like I don't care feeling. And when I really do well, I'm able to channel that feeling, and I just get up and I don't care. And I've noticed that because a lot of times, even doing shows with you, one day I did a show at this place called Strawberries, I remember, and you came, and I started talking about furniture that because I, I went shopping, and it was hysterical. Another time I went to a church with you, and I was coming, and I just finished taking a nap, and I just talked about taking the nap before I came, and I didn't even have time to think or process, and it just flew out, and I just didn't care, and it just came out great. Other times I was like running late for shows and I basically set up and I, and I had to go right on stage and I didn't have a time to think and it just flowed out. A lot of times if I have too much time to think or prepare and it doesn't go right from the get-go, 
I, I have a little nervousness um, with that. So, um, you know, I do now get more nervous than I used to. Like, you go up there and did hours, and I was like, holy, how do you do that, man? Like, and I used to do rehabs and detoxes, and that's how I got started. I used to go to comedy classes and entertain for them to say, hey, you can have fun without drinking or drugging. And I used to bring, like, three comics with me and do, like, an hour. And I remember one day, none of the comics showed up. So it was just me there. And I'm like, where is everyone? How am I going to kill an hour? I only got 15 minutes. You know, I got 20 minutes at the most. And I did a whole hour. And I just started talking about me and twisting things. And I had fun. And then I'm like, I don't want to bring anyone anymore. I want to do the whole hour by myself. <laughs> um, but it was, um, it was almost out of like, I had to do it, so I did it. And then... Um, I was actually, I could do more than I thought I, I could do. And sometimes I run things by you. I'm like, well, I should get this person to go to California to do this show. And you're like, Keith, why don't you do the show? There's no one better than you to do this kind of material. And sometimes I, I do have those insecurities, and i got to be reminded, you know, that, uh, you know, um, no, you can do this, and you probably are the best person for that. And, um, you know, that's why it's good to have, like, a, a, a comedy family. So after 17 years, you get as nervous or more than when you first started because people correct people, yeah and i think people don't know that like they think oh you know you, you you're a breeze now you've been doing it a long time but i don't think people understand that we don't really know how it's going to go yeah we have no idea yeah. we we don't know it could be great it could be a bomb we don't know it's not like we're going to i almost it. think yeah. i almost think ignorance is good and i'll bring it back to uh me and you, we, 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 booked, we, we got booked to do the show in Brooklyn, oh. and we were all excited. And so we got in our cars, we drove all the way to Brooklyn to do the show, and we were like in a Mexican restaurant um, where no one spoke English and, and with no stage doing comedy, and we couldn't care less, and we had fun. Like, now I'm like, well, the mic isn't set up right. The crowd ain't right. The lighting should be like this. Like, you know, uh, you know this ain't going to work because this isn't the type of – I didn't care. I didn't think. I didn't know anything. So kind of the ignorance of me at that time actually worked as a benefit to doing comedy. Now it's like I almost know too much. Like, you know, uh, you know, it's like, you know, if it ain't perfect, oh, this ain't going to work for this reason. Oh, that guy was horrible, so I'm not going to, you know, the crowd's bad. Or, oh, this guy was too good. How can I follow that? I didn't think about anything. I just got up and did my thing. And, you know, and, and I use that tool now because I realize when I take all that out, so I have to make a mental note to do that. But I was able to do that automatically. With now, I have to remind myself to do that, to, to have my best set. Yeah, so that's, so that's interesting. Uh, so let's say now you were to have a show on a Saturday and now it's Monday. What do you do to prepare for the show? Do you do anything? No. Okay. Do you even think about it on Monday or you don't even, it's out of your head? No. When do you start thinking about it, the show? Brought, you know, uh, that's why comedy is a little, a little funny to me. And, um, sometimes if I have a show and I have to do it, I don't want to do it. If I don't have to do it, it's not like when I was younger, like I wanted to get on stage every time I had a chance to be on stage. Now it's like sometimes I'm like, I don't want to do something I have to do. Right. Like don't, you know, um, like I'll do, I'll like book a lot of shows and I won't even put myself on or I'll put myself on in the beginning to do um, whatever I want, whether it's five minutes or 20 minutes. But I like to have that flexibility. Like that's why I don't think I would want to be like a full-time comic because I don't want to have to get on stage and have to do 45 minutes and have to end the show or have to do it. It takes out the um, spontaneity and the fun of it for me. So part of me being in comedy is liking to run shows and do it my way. And, and I think that's why some comics do really well because they adapt to going on the road, going here, dealing with people, having to do this much time. And I, I, I don't have – life is too short for me. I have too much structure, too many things to do that if I ain't having fun doing comedy, I, I ain't going to do it. Um, you know, I don't want to have to feel forced. And, um, you know, and for a little while I got into that, that rut where I felt like I had to do it and I didn't want to. And, uh, you know, but uh, it, it kind of comes in phases. And I know a lot of comics um, – that took breaks from comedy and probably for the same reason. And then they came back with a new insight, but that's kind of where I'm at now. I used to do a lot more than I do now. I do it from time to time. 
Um, but with my son born and life things that went on, it just kind of cut back. But I'm always thinking comedy. Every life scenario that happens, like I'll call you and I'll say, this happened, this would be a great bit. So it's always in me, even if I'm not on stage doing it. Yeah, that, that's a great point. You know what I started doing, Keith? The, every sh- people that offer me shows, I think, am I going to look forward to this show? And if the answer is no, I say I don't want to do it. And I see a lot of comics doing like a million gigs or out at open mics. And I'm like, well, I don't really would want to do that. I don't want to be on stage every night. So I know exactly what you're talking about. But in the beginning, you did. In the beginning, I did. But now yeah. I just want to, like you said, I just want to enjoy my time up there. So if it means I'm right. not up for two or three weeks, I don't care. As long as I'm looking forward to the next show instead of having it like a job. So what would your ideal comedy career look like then? Well, you know what? I also, comedy led me into doing like motivational speaking, and I spoke in front of, um, you know, like a, a, a panel of social workers, addiction therapists, psychiatrists, and I got, I went to uh, Idaho to do uh, like, it was a public speaking comedy thing. So I was giving a message along with being funny, and it was just such a unique combination. And for me, part of my life is being in recovery. I've been clean 16, you know, over 16 years. I work in the recovery field. I love giving people hope through laughter, and I think that's where my gift is. Like, I look at you and uh, the way you do your church thing, your heart's in it. You know, it's just not about doing comedy. You connect with people in a different way. And I do the same thing with, uh, with people in recovery, like showing them, hey, Believe me, you can have fun, you can laugh, you can have joy. All your friends don't have to be in recovery. You can have other outside friends and still not live that lifestyle and enjoy yourself. And I almost feel a sense of purpose when I'm working in that aspect of recovery. But I also enjoy doing like regular firehouse shows and getting to know people in all aspects. Like I started doing, like we started actually this house site show together and uh, we've been doing that firehouse for like, um, you know, like eight years, nine years now. And through that, doing that show for the firehouse, I started speaking at firehouses on drug and alcohol with one of the chiefs going to all the different firehouses. So comedy opened the door for me that would have never been opened if it wasn't for me just doing regular comedy. It had nothing to do with recovery. But, you know, like you're a believer in God and so am I. God puts things in people in your life for reasons for you to take it to different levels. So Part of doing comedy is like, I don't know what to expect or where it's going to lead me or what vision I can have, but I just know it fills a part of me that doesn't get filled in any other way. That's a great, that's great. Yeah. That is just, that might be the highlight of the show, what you just said right Honestly. there, because it's really deep and it's true. So, Keith, ideally, am I hearing that you'd rather maybe at this point do some motivational speaking than comedy, if it was your choice? No, I just, um, I like to do motivational speaking, but I also like to do, I just like to enjoy the journey of whatever it is. And whether it's doing comedy or not, you can motivate someone, you can meet someone, you can have a relationship and it can change your life, it can change their lives, it can change anyone's life. So every opportunity when I do comedy, I meet a new person, I meet you, I meet a lot of comics. Some of them like that are road comics, and I'm not going to divulge their name, they find out I'm in comedy, and I, I booked them for the show, they're like, wow, I just got into recovery, and we end up connecting, it wasn't through recovery, it was through comedy, and I... You know, um, by them knowing who I am, I have an impact in their life. Just like with me and you, like, you know, uh, you've had family and friends that were struggling and, and, uh, you know, and I've, you know, you've talked to me about things and I've talked to you about things in my life with my ups and downs and I respect your advice and where you're coming from. And these relationships are invaluable. And if I try to pick and choose where I go when I do it and and just leave it out of my hands and let God, like, you know, it sounds corny, but just let God do what God does and put me around people in situations and just sit there with an open mind and a willingness to kind of have some fun with it. And if more comes from it, great. But, um, you know, I'm meant to grow in so many different ways. And I don't know where I'm meant to be at any given time. And uh, I'm going to use the analogy with Jonah with the whale. You know, like he didn't know where he needed to be. The whale took him there. He got there and he made it. You know, so I never know who I'm supposed to talk to, when I'm supposed to, how. I mean, look at you. Me and you talked and we met. And you're the one in jail dealing with people, you know, um, uh, teaching them comedy. And, uh, you know, and, and you're not a guy who's ever been arrested or had a drug or alcohol problem. But 
through your comedy journey, you've ended up reaching people in rehabs and detoxes and people I know or people in jails just because you stopped overthinking where you're going to go and what crowd is right for you and what you're going to do and just went with God's plan. And part of me believes that. And um, that's why I enjoy the comedy journey. Okay, so that, that's a great answer, too. So yeah. basically you're saying, hey, you're enjoying the comedy journey. If it leads you to not doing comedy, that's, that's great. Correct? That's okay. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah, which is, I don't think a lot of comics would say that, Keith. They're yeah. so into doing comedy that I think if you take them off the stage, they don't, they have no identity whatsoever. Yeah, that ain't the case for me. I mean, I love comedy. It's a part of my life. Like, like you took, Scott is a, a you know, like you interviewed Scott, and he's a life comic. You know, that was his life. That was his. Comedy is a part of my life, but it ain't like I'm not a guy who's going to um, and I'm not, I'm not going to say I'm not going to because you never know where life can take you and what opportunities can present themselves. But my goal is not to not work a day job and to do comedy and to get a sitcom and to do this. And, but whatever way I'm meant to go, I'm all right with it. And, uh, you know, whatever way I'm meant to help, I'm cool with it. And, you know, it's just I don't have I've done everything I wanted to do in comedy. I've traveled around the United States. I've had shows with hundreds of people and succeeded. I've opened for Gilbert Godfrey, and I went on the road with Rich Voss and Mikey Stefano and worked with some amazing comics, um, you know, even working with you, booking the Jackie Mason show. So I've done everything from bookings to being on the road to being, uh, you know, put up into hotels to traveling to working with top-notch comics and doing really well, uh, you know, so... I basically said, hey, I'm happy. If it ends today, I could say I had a great journey doing comedy and I loved what I did. If there's more to be done, I'm good with that too, you know? Yeah, I think, Andrew, you had a question for him, right? Because I think it ties into what he's just been saying. I did, yeah. So you said you were doing comedy for 17 years, right? So I, you go ahead. if you could go back and, you know, go back to like when you first started, is there anything you would have done differently? Um, I never really thought about that. Um, you know what? I, I, I really don't think I would have because really? I think I think I needed to be where I was at every given time when I was there because I would have never did what I did to start out comedy if I would have known the whole business and what comedy yeah, was you, and you, the you, politics you, behind you it. Either, I wouldn't yeah. have been doing these bringer shows and going to hotels and asking them, can we run shows and running out? To, I just wouldn't have done it if I knew the whole picture. So <laughs> if I wasn't a little ignorant in the beginning, I would have never had the drive I needed. And as I matured in my life and in comedy, it's what I want to do. It's not what I have to do today. Mm -hmm. So it's something that, you know, through my evolution and through learning, uh, like only a certain amount was revealed to me at the, a certain time. And if it wasn't done like that, I would have never, you know, been able to do what I did. You know, and more is revealed to me now because I've worked in big shows. I've done a lot. I know what it takes to be uh, a, a road comic, to do a cruise thing, to, to really get on the road, the, the time, the effort. The, uh, the commitment, and, um, you know, and, and I have that choice to either do that or not. So I don't think I would have changed anything because I think I needed to go in the order I went to to really get what I needed out of comedy. And it really, I'm really happy with where I'm at and, um, you know, um, and, and where I may go. And I don't know that. I might really get into it again, and, you know, my sons too, and I love what you and Andrew did. I mean, I love that you made it, even this show, that you're with your son doing something you love with your son and Andrew, that you love it too, and it's something a father and son can do together and have their own perspective and do. And my son's too now. So as soon as he could start doing more than babble, <laughs> I'm, I'm giving him a mic and putting him on semantics. You know? <laughs> as long as he's clean. If he repeats some of my language, she might not allow him, and they might. But, uh, you know, he's... Uh, He's, uh, you know, I would love to see if he was into something like that and make it more than just comedy, a way to bond with my son. And uh, that is one of the things I love about you and Andrew, that, like, you know, he doesn't only come to the show and, you know, and, and uh, you know, you guys do shows together and it's time that you get to spend together. And um, that's our most precious thing we have is our time. And uh, so wanting to do comedy and having to do comedy are two different things for me. So do you think everyone should do a little bit of comedy at some point in their life? I'm dead serious about that question. I think 
humor is so important, and if you can learn to twist things and, and have a little fun with them instead of taking everything so serious, it really does help your quality of life. People who laugh live longer. They live their quality of life is better. The length of their life is better. Yeah. There's actually medical documentation that does with that. And I work in a hospital, and I've seen lives saved through comedy. They were actually going to have me work with people with serious wounds, with wound cares and use comedy to help them heal while they're dealing with wounds because it actually does things that, you know, of course we know the outward feeling, like it feels good to laugh and it's great, but it actually is helping us with our anxiety, our nerves, our blood pressure, you know, um, and healing, um, anxiety. It does so much for us medically. Um, there's actually a book. I did a report on this, um, you know, in school, um, in my case act school, Human Therapy. And I actually use humor in therapy because, um, you know, I, I, I say, hey, just because we laugh on, about it doesn't mean we're minimizing it or not acknowledging it for what it is. But it can help us heal from it. And as you know, you've been working with me for a while, and you and Andrew both know my, um, my hand bit. I lost my hand, which is something very serious. And it's probably one of my best comedy bits because I'm most connected with it. And I had to go through my pain and struggle for years of depression. And now I can talk about it. And it's like people who know me don't even really think about my hand or realize I, I have a prosthetic hand and, uh, you know, I was in a fire and lost my digits. So um, it's, um, you know, it's given me a new perspective, and I try to, uh, to, to impart that on others. So I think everyone should have a little fun with it, whether it's getting on stage or just writing down things that you think is funny and sharing it with a friend. Yeah, that's a good perspective on your hand, Keith, because, I mean, you started doing that hand bit in that class with Carrie Caravis. I think she helped you work through that bit. Do you feel that it's helped you deal with losing it? Yes, and it's also helped others. Because when people feel bad about themselves or, or, or like what's, you know, and then they say, hey, look at this guy. You know, he was, uh, you know, he did some crazy things. He lost an arm and he's just like enjoying life. He's living life. He has a son. He's going around with friends. I think attraction rather than promotion, like, you know, it's attractive the way I live. It's not what I say. It's the way I choose to live. And it comes out in my comedy. And I think for me, um, being who I am and what I do, I have to embrace, you know, um, who I am and things I've been through, which are my struggles and stuff. And that's why the recovery comedy and working with people with troubled past is my, is my, um, you know, forte. It's something that's not, it's a, it's like a purpose for me. And, um, you know, and that's why I, um, you know, I, I, comedy has taken on a different level for me with my work, with my therapy, with my counseling, with reaching individuals who don't talk to people to kind of break the ice with comedy, not to make fun of a situation, but to kind of frame it in a different perspective where someone can deal with it. Who's the best live comic you've ever seen? You know what? I, I'm going to – there's two of them. One's alive and one's dead. Um, Mike DiStefano. Um, he's one of the best I've ever worked with, ever seen, and I connected with him on a personal level. And you did, too. We were actually thinking of representing him in certain areas, so we met with him. But this guy, I met him because I was working in a detox, and this guy goes to me, he goes, he goes, you're a good comic, you're funny, but this guy's real funny. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was like, well, you know what? You know, and I took it, but then I saw him. I was like, oh, my God. So I called him. And I was like, Mike, this guy's struggling, and he's in rehab, and, uh, you know, uh, he mentioned you, and um, if you can give him a call, it would mean a lot. Wow. And Mike was pretty big at the time, so Mike called the rehab, and this guy gave this guy hope, and this guy stuck around, and it just made his day. And then me and Mike met, and then I, he kind of put me under his wing, and I started doing recovery comedy for him, booking all kinds of conventions. And, That's right. Um, I remember. And, and, I remember. He, right. And uh, he took me under his wing and introduced me to some big names, and that's you know, part of my, um, you know, journey. So he was one of the best I ever seen, and I related to him. And the other one would have to be Keith Anthony. Um, I love yeah. Keith Anthony, man. It, it just every time I watch him, I'll put him up against any guy who's, who's a superstar and on TV. Uh, Keith Anthony, any given day, could be the funniest human being in the world. You know, it's funny you mentioned those two names because I would have said the same exact two names. Uh, Stefano had something special about him on stage. He had that... Like his like his likability was so high, and he could tell you "f you" to the audience, and they would laugh. Like 
Yeah. He was so... He used to boo... The, yeah. One of his jokes is he used to boo the audience. Yeah, he goes, when they didn't yeah. like something it was too bad, he would boo them. Yeah, uh, and they were like, oh, we're well, sorry, Mike. Yeah, it was, <laughs> yeah, it was so great. He was... I agree with you. It was so, He was just really fantastic. I was rooting for him to win that uh, last comic standing. And Keith Anthony, on any given day, is the best I've ever seen. I couldn't agree yeah. with you more. He is just... I don't know. He's, he's just great. at a different level. When I watch him, I want to quit comedy. I'm like, oh, I better quit. This guy's just so good. Right. And also, like, if you're out in town and, like, you're like, oh, is Keith Anthony playing anywhere? And me and you've seen him, like, um, probably 50 times. <laughs> but if he's playing, we'll go see him again. And, and it's just you can watch him over and over and over. Like, you have comics like John LaRocchia, who's funny. But if you've seen him three or four times, you can basically do his act. You know, like, he's, he's really good at what he does, but Keith Anthony just talking about what's going on in the world and, you know, and, and uh, you know, and just where he's at on any given day. And it just, um, it's amazing, uh, you know, so, and he's such a nice guy to know him personally and to see him on stage. It's like Jekyll and Hyde, you know. Keith, if you could give a young comic some advice, there might be some people listening to the podcast saying, what would you give uh, advice to a young comic getting started? Just have fun, man. Don't overthink it. Just go, um, you know, have some fun, you know. Yeah, just, um, you know, and if someone's willing to, uh, that's been around, willing to, you know, um, show you some things, just listen. Keep an open mind and just have fun with it. You know, um, don't go out to be a star. Well, if you want to be a star and have fun with it, great. You know, as you're around long enough, you'll, uh, you know, like me and you both, it's like, I should be on TV. And then you watch someone like Keith Anthony. He's like, I don't even belong on stage. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I, I, I should be working in a kitchen, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, making uh, good uh, uh, cannolis or something. I, I, I shouldn't even be doing comedy. But, uh, you know, it, it's just the, uh, you know, but no matter where I am, uh, I'm having fun with it. And I'm in, uh, improving, and just enjoy yourself with it, and constantly evolve, and get better, and enjoy the journey, and realize it's not all good and it's not all bad, and uh, make some valuable relationships with people, get to know people as people, and um, that's one of my greatest gifts in comedy. Like if I had ever did comedy again, I would have you. As, I'm going to have you as a friend for the rest of my life, or the rest of your life, or you know, and Andrew, and, and um, you know, you know, knowing your son and your family. Like I go there. There's some even Scott. I mean, you know, all the relationships are a little different, but I have some friendships that are you know amazing that came through just you know doing comedy because a piece of you gets known to everybody if you're really doing it just to um, enjoy it. And um, like me and you both know. Um, Get on stage, um, host some open mics, just have fun, talk to people. Don't always do a bit, just have some fun and just start talking to people and, uh, you know, and just enjoy, enjoy the journey. You, and, and that's wherever it leads, it's okay. You know, it's, Whether it's you do comedy for two weeks and, and you don't, you know, at least you could say, hey, I tried it. It Maybe it was for me, maybe it wasn't for me, but, you know, it, I tried it. And, you know, anything you try is not a failure. You know what it reminds me a little bit with that you just said is Chesterfields, kind of. That's what we did at Chesterfields. We just started having fun there. Yeah, I think you told me that um, once because you're like, just stop doing bits because I would like – and uh, I remember Joey G, you know, who's a comic. He goes, Keith, if I hear that <laughs> hand bit one more time, I'm going to shoot myself. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, oh, you mean I shouldn't do the same hand bit every time I get on stage? You know, like, let me just talk to people and have fun. But this all came from keeping an open mind and listening to others and having some fun while I was doing it. And, uh, you know, you're a big part of that because we've both given each other constructive feedback and, uh, you know, other comics, too, and, and other people I've worked with and learning off of other people's successes and failures and, um, you know, utilizing it all to uh, – you know, make comedy what I want for myself. And that's what everyone's got to remember. You make it what you want to make it for yourself. Don't compare what you do to what anyone else does. It's just for you. What's the, the worst bomb you can remember that you did? Can you remember one particular bomb? I do. I'll never forget oh, yeah, it. Uh, I, <laughs> it was at Chesterfield, and we did a show, um, and it was my job. Everyone from my job was coming down, and me and you were setting show. it up. And then I was show. like, all these people, and I was the first one up. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I was like, well, what? Because I had all this confidence, because I figured, and people were still getting seated, and everything was going on, and I just started doing my bit, and it was f- dead silence. <laughs> and it was like awkward, <laughs> dead silence. And I'm like, 
some of these people will never see me perform again from my job. And I felt this added pressure. And then I started to not hear the laughter and it got inside my head. And I was kind of new in comedy. I wasn't that experienced where I knew how to come off my material and just talk to people. So I was like locked on my material. And no matter what I told it, my nervousness, my fear, all came exuberating. And, um, and the worst thing is when someone from my job still says, oh, yeah, I seen you at Chesterfield. You were good. I was like, no, I wasn't. I was horrible, you know. But I, I remember that, and, uh, you know, I'll never forget it because I remember calling people afterwards. Like, when I have a bad set, I'll, like, call you or I'll call – I used to call Joey G. I was like, I'm horrible. I'm – you know, and I would process it, and then I would feel a little bit better when I shared it. Like, you'd be like, well – and even you. You and Andrew will go to some shows. You'll be like, Keith, that was a painful show. But you'll go out and do the next show, and you'll kill. You know, like, for you, anytime you have a bad show, all you need to do is fly back to New York and do some masters, that's and you'll true. think you're a star yeah, again. That's true. <laughs> That's true. So, so Keith, the, the key when you're starting to bomb, you mentioned it. I just want—I agree with you, but I don't think everybody does—is to move away from your material and try to reconnect with the audience somehow. Yeah, acknowledging the elephant in the room too. Acknowledge the bomb. Wow, that really sucked. This is real. You know, like have a little fun with bombing. Uh, you know, like you know, like everyone knows you're bombing. By you <laughs> pretending you're not bombing isn't going to help. You know. <laughs> You just acknowledge that was freaking horrible. This isn't easy for me up here, people. You know, uh, you know, and, and they'll they'll appreciate the honesty. And you know, if you're if not funny, at least be likable and be honest. You know, and, and sometimes when you come off it, it might not be a great set, but it'll be like, ah, he wasn't great, but he was he was decent. You know, and sometimes you just get away with having a mediocre set, and that's okay. But if you stay on your material and you aren't willing to come off, it's just it's uh, it's it's just a disaster, and I'll never forget that because thanks to that bomb, it taught me how to become a better comic. So that was probably because I, you know, as soon as you asked me, I knew it, and I told you, and that in detail helped me to become a better comic because, um, you know, without that bomb and feeling that bad, I would have thought I was great all the time. Uh, yeah, and I, I think when I'm saying pull off your material, you have to stop material, and even if you go into the audience and just totally improv. I think it's better than just staying on your material. I see a lot of comics just they just stick with their material and whatever happens happens. Yeah, no, there are comics like that, but uh, mostly newer comics. But um, you know, I think the most important thing is to you know to have some kind of uh, you know to get some kind of rapport and uh, you know, and that's why hosting such a valuable thing to start hosting. That's good because advice. it's not about yeah. going into your jokes and you don't have to be funny. You just have to bring up the other comics and set a good stage and just be comfortable. You know, it ain't your job to go up there and kill. And to find a good host, you'll always get work. I'm always looking for someone who's a good host, you know, and, and uh, you know, and uh, a lot of people don't have that skill because they want to just kill and be funny. And they just want to do their material, and hosting is a little more of a kind of improv slash inserting material when appropriate. It's, a, it's harder. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, what, exactly. What about the uh, the worst bomb you ever witnessed besides your own? Does anything come to mind at all? Um, you I've seen Evan Weiss have some pretty bad sets, man. Uh, you know, like when I think of bombs, because it's happened more than once, you know, when I've seen them, you know, and, uh, you know, so I don't know if it was the worst one I've seen. Um, I remember this one guy, he was a new comic, and... Uh, You'll remember him, Nate Watts. He oh, was. Oh, uh, I remember Nate Watts with the hat. He yeah, he, you know, hat. yeah, and he used to go and he'd say to Keith, "I did this comedy show for this college, and they're going to pay me money." And, and I'm like, "You're a new comic. Get someone else. Introduce the other guy. Have a little fun with the crowd." But he, but he was so stuck on doing it himself. He asked me for advice, and then he didn't take any of it. So I was like, "Well, you know, how did you do?" He goes, "Well, I did a half hour." You know, I think I did okay, but nobody laughed. I go, if you did a half hour in comedy and no one laughed, you didn't do good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people used to get off the stage and, during the shows and tell me and you, the audience stinks. <laughs> like, what do, you, what do you mean the audience stinks? You stink. If no one's laughing, it's your fault. I mean, I take full responsibility if no one's laughing. It's not their You know, fault. it's the funniest, like, if there's three comics on the uh, on the stage and the other two did well and you did bad. Like, the audience stunk just for me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, I had the worst spot. Yeah, I had the worst you know, audience. That, yeah. <laughs> My, my audience yeah, I had bad. the worst spot. I, I broke the ice doing the first spot or the second spot. That was the toughest. Like, there's always an excuse. Like, the one thing I think that 
that makes you better is to acknowledge, you know, and, and to look at, you know, where you make your mistakes, what you do right and what you do wrong, and, um, you know, just learn from it because no one, you, you, it's, it's like a chess, I love chess, I'm a chess player, but you can never master chess. You can never peak. You can never exactly. get, that's, same thing with comedy. It can never be mastered. Comparison. That's an excellent point, actually. You know, it can never be mastered. You can always do something different, better, and every day it's not granted you're going to have your best chess game, and every day you're not going to have your best comedy set. And there's some variables that, you know, play into it that you might not even know, but after the set you can look at it and learn from it. Hey, that was awesome, Keith, but I think we're uh, pretty much out of time here. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, and for those listening, make sure you tune in next week for when we interview Carrie Caravis. Thank you and good night.